the second part of the event focuses on a series of case studies, and we've already seen a number of case studies in our first uh, session. But we're beginning with a presentation by Jim Gardner, um, and who's going to outline a research program looking at embodied energy of heritage buildings and applying an integrated life cycle assessment approach to understanding their energy usage. So Jim is, an ex is Executive Director of Statutory Planning and Heritage in the newly formed Department of Transport Planning and Local Infrastructure. And he leads the delivery of statutory decision making across planning, environmental assessment and non-Indigenous non historic heritage. Jim is trained in architecture and in building conservation and he's worked in private practice, heritage organisations and government. Jim's topic today is sustainability and heritage, the heritage chairs and officials of Australia and New Zealand response and I think that's a fabulous name for an organisation. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody. And I will probably start off by explaining who the Heritage Chairs and Officials of Australia and New Zealand are. It's a group that reports into um, various COAG, so Council of Australian Government um, uh, Standing Committees. It is made up of the chairs of every heritage, um, every jurisdiction, uh, heritage council rather, around Australasia, and the heads of the various heritage agencies, of which I used to be one. Um, now, why is the Heritage Chairs and Officials of Australia and New Zealand um, interested in this? Well, they recognise that this debate about heritage and sustain or environmental sustainability was really going on without them. We were also getting some um, evidence coming through from local government that argues, arguments were starting to be made um, for the demolition of um, heritage buildings within conservation areas or heritage overlays on the basis that it would be more environmentally friendly to rebuild in a six-star um, first-rate or actuate rated um, property. There was also considerable concern from some of the people with um, expertise on the Heritage Council of Victoria, people like Stuart McLennan, who's a member of the, um, um, the what, what is now the Victorian Building Authority um, review panel um, on the reductive nature of the star rating systems and that these didn't take account of some of the attributes of traditional buildings. So the thermal mass we've heard about um, before, embodied energy, passive solar design um, and the natural ventilation and design and lighting um, which Noy and Craig have talked about already. Um, and there were also, these star ratings also led to some perverse outcomes. For instance, the Green Star um, ratings um, gave credit for the removal of heritage fabric with the, and the replacement with modern environmentally sustainable materials. And this ignored issues of waste generation, the environmental cost of new material production, which we've heard about from Robert, as well as transportation and construction. Now, the initial focus of these studies was on embodied energy, and this probably reflected um, that default position that a lot of heritage um, professionals go to that we've got this existing building, therefore embodied energy is probably the argument, our biggest um, um, trump card we can play to fight these battles of why we shouldn't demolish um, to produce a more sustainable future. So the aim of the studies were to increase public and industry understanding of the energy embodied in buildings, but also take that to the next stage to assess the sustainability, value, costs and benefits of common interventions to improve overall environmental performance. And what I'll do is I'll concentrate perhaps on this study rather than some of the other work which was going on in parallel. Both the Queensland Heritage Council and the Heritage Council of Victoria adopted formal policies which informed decision making on recognising the benefit of heritage buildings to environmental <coughs> sustainability. There was also technical guidance produced around how you um, interact with the Building Code of Australia and um, uh, um, finding alternative solutions. Um, and there was technical guidance produced by um, Heritage Tasmania about the siting of um, photovoltaics, solar hot water and um, other modern interventions, including water tanks, which Leon's talked about. 
So one of the first things we did was look around and see what information is out there. Um, CSIRO's Human Settlements um, theme study within the Australian State of Environment report in 2001 identified that the energy embodied in the existing building stock in Australia is equivalent to approximately 10 years of the total energy consumption in the entire nation. Now I think, was it Robert who made the point about, but heritage is actually quite a small component um, of the existing um, built fa uh, fabric within Australia. Now, and that's a position that the Heritage Council were taking as well at the time, which was, we don't actually have to make these arguments because heritage is such a small portion of that. Well, I don't actually think it is. When you look in the Victorian context, we have 160,000 individual properties covered by heritage overlays in one form or another. Um, the most recent um, Australian State of Environment report, its chapter on heritage identifies that more than 10% of the land in Victoria is covered by um, some kind of historic or indigenous heritage control. So there is actually, it is actually quite a substantial proportion of our extant built stock that has some heritage value and therefore we need to consider these two issues together. Um, also within this report, it identified that construction waste accounts for a third of all landfill in Australia. But now I'll move on to perhaps three of my favourite pieces of research. Um, these are now getting a bit long in the tooth, but they were some of the things that inspired the work we went on to do. The UK's Building Research Establishment Study, the measurement of residential embodied energy and heritage housing in 2003, identified that the typical the embodied energy inherent in the materials and construction of the typical Victorian house in London contains the energy equivalent of 15,000 litres of petrol, or enough to send a car around the earth five times or halfway to the moon. I, sorry, I can't convert that into how many times around Australia it is, but I'm sure it's several. Um, likewise, in its 2008 report, New Tricks with Old Bricks, and that's a great title, how, to reuse, how Reusing Historic Buildings Can Cut Carbon Emissions, the UK's Empty Homes Agency, which is actually a not-for-profit group rather than a government agency, um, identified that reusing empty homes could make an initial saving of 35 tonnes of carbon dioxide per property by removing the energy locked up in the new material and construction. And that is that foregoing of that that new material would have to do if we were building new housing rather than adapting the old. And in the US, Place Economics, a Washington DC based economics and development consultancy, identified that demolishing the typical 8 metre wide by 40 metre deep commercial building of the type you'd find on any North American historic Main Street would wipe out the entire environmental benefit of recycling 1.3 million aluminium cans, or, putting it another way, wasting uh, 3,500 gigajoules of energy. And I think if you ask anyone, they find it easier to visualise 1.3 million Coke cans <laughs> than they do to visualise 3,500 gigajoules of energy. Now, while the assessment of embodied energy is not an exact science, and I'll come on to a point that Robert made um, earlier, these three examples all tell a clear and compelling story of the magnitude of energy that's wasted through the demolition of these existing buildings. So the study that the um, Heritage Council initiated in partnership with a number of other agencies, including the Building Commission, Office of Victorian Government Architect, and the then Department of, Environmental, of Sustainability and Environment, was to look at um, 10 case studies of domestic or domestically scaled institutional buildings in Victoria and doing them at sort of 20 to 30 year intervals. So we had late Victorian terrace, um, freestanding Edwardian house, an interwar house, a post-war brick veneer house, a apartment block from the 1930s, 1970s middle suburban house, and as a comparator, an early 2000s um, five-star energy efficient house as well as a heritage-listed state school building and courthouse. 
Now, what we were seeking here was some instantly recognisable archetypes, the kind of buildings that people could relate to, the ones you'd find in a conservation area heritage overlay. And we used the Watt House's um, guidebook to architectural styles as our starting point. And the majority of these place examples we used were on local here, identified in the local planning scheme, in the, cons in the heritage overlay, rather than being of state or national importance. Now, this debate was obviously a national debate, and this resonated with the other partners from the heritage chairs and officials of Australia and New Zealand. And so with their funding, it was extended to other states and territories, bringing in examples that weren't represented in Victoria. So the classic Queenslander, um, the um, Northern Territory cyclone-proof house, um, Tasmanian um, Georgian examples, um, and New Zealand. And modelling was also undertaken, as well as in the capital cities within those um, states, the modelling of all the examples was undertaken in two New South Wales locations. New South Wales, interestingly, thought that the architectural styles were covered by all the other states, so that's interesting, I think. Um, uh, so RMIT Centre for Design led this project, and it was to identify the quantum of embodied energy using knowledge of the construction methods of the time, the materials, and QS estimates. This actually came up with surprisingly low results, and lower than the results Robert has already presented. It was also lower than the equivalent UK research, and so our emphasis then shifted away from embodied design to look more at... Um, life cycle assessment. So through this, we were assessing the energy in use um, for each of the buildings in their base case. That is uninsulated, unmodified. Then we did those, that same analysis, testing a num number of common interventions to improve energy efficiency. So that was ceiling, floor and wall insulation, draft exclusion, secondary and double glazing, external screening, use of window film, thermal curtains, etc. But what we did do at that point, too, was to discount any of those methods which would have an adverse impact on the significance of the various housing types. Um, and the aim was to identify a range of solutions um, targeted to each building type and each climactic zone or location. Now, Robert's already talked a bit about um, integrated life cycle assessment. Um, I understand this project was one of the first applications of that to uh, heritage building stock. And LCA, as we've heard, looks at both the operational and the embodied energy and assesses them in terms of material use and energy consumption from cradle to grave. So it provides, therefore, a much more complete means of analysing the energy requirement and the environmental impact of these buildings. So it looks at that initial embodied energy, the energy to use to produce the materials, the components from extraction, manufacturing, transport. It looks like on-site energy associated with construction activities. The operational energy, so that's lighting, heating, cooling, and ventilation. The reoccurring embodied energy, which Robert's also touched on, which is the energy used to refurbish and maintain the building. And noting that the typical office building, for instance, goes through a very major refurbishment at least every 25 to 30 years. And LCA also extends the energy used to demolish and dispose of the building at the end of its life, including waste management and transport, and can provide credit for the reuse and recycling of components to complete that life cycle. So in the domestic buildings example, um, the heating and cooling load for each property was assessed in each geographic location and modelled using Actuate. Um, obviously, the results for that differed greatly depending on the climactic um, zone. It was then remodelled for each intervention and the combination of the most effective interventions because doing, say, putting ceiling insulation in and putting thermal curtains in produces a different result than doing those two things separately. It's not just an additive process. We also considered the appliance efficiency, and that gave us then the delivered energy, that is, the energy consumed on site. The 
we then wanted to take that further because we wanted to look at what the actual environmental impact is, not just what the energy use was. So we looked at the primary energy, that is the amount of energy in on-site consumption, plus the losses that occur through generation, transmission and distribution. And that gave us that primary energy, energy that was needed to be created um, at source, at the power station, at the hydroelectric dam, at whatever. And then we looked at the carbon emissions based on a typical um, shopping basket of energy sources for each state or territory. And of course, this dif differed enormously like the geographic, like the different climactic zones. So for instance, Tasmania, um, electricity produces much less um, greenhouse gas emissions than it does in Victoria. So this allowed us to translate that life cycle energy to life cycle greenhouse gas emissions to identify the actual environmental impact. And on this chart, you can see that initial embodied energy in construction, the slow growth of the annual operation, uh, operational energy, then that hiccup as we refurbish this building, um, continued operational energy, and then a reduction in the greenhouse gas emission as materials are recycled and reused. Um, this study, however, stopped at that dotted line because we made the assumption that these buildings, being heritage listed, would exist in perpetuity. So where did this get, to, get us to? Well, um, the Minister for Planning in Victoria recently launched guidance for property owners and designers, which drew on the Victorian data. Um, it's available for download at heritage.vic.gov.au, and I encourage you to look at it. Um, there's a start off with an introduction, which explained the purpose, approach, methodology, and assumptions of the study. It identified for instance, that the four most common interventions um, across all the examples could provide very substantial savings. So, for instance, ceiling insulation produced a reduction in the heating and cooling energy required of between 8 and 52 per cent, depending on the example. Underfloor insulation of between 3 and 16 per cent. Thermal curtains of between 2 and 11 per cent. And draft ceiling of between 4 and 34 per cent. Now, the way we approached embodied energy, though, was that arguably slightly outdated way of looking at the embodied resources rather than that avoided resource demand that Robert was advocating for earlier. So I'll just take you through one of the guidance sheets. Um, interestingly, it was very hard to get people to lend us their houses to do this, and most of the houses are owned by staff of Heritage Victoria, including this one. <laughs> So each sheet describes the house and the features of that period, as I say, drawing on what house is that. Um, it looks at the embodied energy. And in most examples, we've got about less than half of the um, embodied energy per square metre that Robert was talking about. In this case, five gigajoules per square metre for the 1875 um, Victorian Terrace. It looked at life cycle energy usage, the costs and potential energy savings of the three or four most effective interventions and the potential star rating improvement. Um, in this case, ceiling insulation at the cost of $1,000 reduces energy usage by up to 37%. Draft ceiling costing $1,100 by up to 18% and thermal curtains costing $1,700 by up to 4%. But in total, these three interventions costing $3,800, which is a roughly modest sum, could reduce the energy used in heating and cooling by up to 57%, or that is 73 gigajoules per square metre over a 100-year period. And this saves in energy bills at 2012 prices between $300 and $500 per annum and can improve the star rating by 2.7 stars. So seven guidance sheets were produced in total um, as I say, we were taking this sort of 20-year interval from the 1870s um, through to the 2000s. What we haven't seen yet, unfortunately, is other jurisdictions um, picking up and running with this, because these really only apply to the Victorian climactic zone, 
and the, and the, um, the costings apply and saving potential applies to the cost of energy consumption in this state. But all the data exists to allow this to be done on a national scale. Now, building on this methodology, the Heritage Chairs and officials um, wanted to look at commercial buildings. And this came about because of concerns, particularly from in Queensland, of the loss of post-war potentially uh, buildings with potential heritage value but were unlisted. Um, and it's these commercial buildings which they were seeing being pulled down and the arguments being made about their sustainability values. So this study, which was say built on the residential building study, reviewed current policy and regulation relating to environmental performance of existing commercial buildings. It assessed embodied energy using the LCA tool SEMA Pro, and that was based on original um, drawings of the buildings and QS estimates again. And it modelled thermal performance and operational energy on Apache SIM, which is based on first principle models of heat transfer processes driven by real weather data. So um, this was a much more expensive study to undertake per case study because you couldn't just use um, traditional modelling tools like First Trade. It has to be done through first principles modelling and real weather data. So this was to calculate greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts, um, assess the embodied energy, and a review the various in interventions um, on energy performance and environmental sustainability. So we identified four commercial heritage listed buildings selected across, from across Australia representing a range of periods and construction types. So we have the Lands Department in Bridge Street, Sydney from 1877, which is up for sale if anyone wants to buy it. Uh, the Government Building in Adelaide from 1901. Um, the interwar AMP building in Townsville, and the Victorian Treasury building in Melbourne um, from 1969 by Yunkin and Freeman, which is the one which is probably most similar to the type of buildings that led to the initiation of this study, that is those post-war um, 1960s and 70s buildings. So the modelling for each of these examples was redone in each capital city climactic zone. And during this process was at the time when the National Australian Built Environment Rating Systems, or Neighbours, was becoming an um, Australia-wide industry-recognised standard for um, buildings being leased and built to identify what the likely, to inform tenants what the likely impact would be. And Neighbours rates these buildings um, are from a five-star top performer to a one-star poor performer. Now, would anyone hazard a guess as to which was the worst performer amongst these buildings? That's a very, very insightful guess, but I know it wasn't a guess. Um, yes, the three pre-war buildings in their completely unaltered state, other than the um, various refurbishments they'd had over the years, all rated above average or strong performer without any intervention. Well, the 1960s building rated the most poorly, not just in energy use, but also in water use. And this is probably a salient point that when you commission research, you have to be prepared for it to say exactly the opposite to what you wanted it to. <laughs> um, what we did find, though, was that um, building operation dominated the life cycle energy use and environmental impacts of these four case studies that the building operational requirements were driven primarily by lighting, cooling and equipment use rather than heating. Um, we also found that interventions to fabric had a much lesser impact than they did in the residential examples and were generally not cost effective or able to be done without having an adverse impact on the heritage um, values of the place. Having said that though, we found that there were very significant improvements in environmental performance and energy use of between 27 and 42 per cent could be made through some very simple um, interventions to heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems. So upgrading the efficiency of lighting and chiller plant, switching off office equipment were not in use, and even simple things just like raising the cooling point by two degrees could achieve benefits of that kind of magnitude. 
So that study, we haven't yet um, written up as case studies. The reports for these and the raw data is freely available. We're going to revamp what we have on the Heritage Council's website in this space um, to make it more accessible. Um, but I would like to get to a point where we have similar advice to these for those commercial buildings. Um, but the findings um, from this study, and I think this is um, unique in Australia, um, some of them sound like they are um, self-evident, and that's true, but one of the things we decided, one of the reasons we decided to do this was we were making these assertions, but we didn't have any evidence to back it up. Now I think we can make these assertions and have the evidence. So what we found, though, was that heritage buildings often have lower initial and recurring embodied energy due to low intensity materials. And this probably goes back to Robert's point that we should be looking at the energy uh, which would be embodied in the replacement building rather than the energy embodied in, in brick and timber and these lower, less energy intensive materials. The production of building materials was a significant component of embodied energy rather than the construction, as we've heard earlier. Um, energy for maintenance and refurbishment varies enormously depending on the materials used and the frequency of replacement. Um, but that an embodied energy is an important consideration, accounting for up to 19% of the energy consumption um, of the domestic examples and up to 24% of those small institutional examples I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but it was a much lower percentage for the um, commercial, large commercial buildings. But this figure, of course, increases as if energy consumption is reduced through these interventions or if a 50-year life cycle assessment is undertaken. Given that the average lifespan of a house built today in Australia is probably more like 80 years rather than 100 years, that has a major impact on what proportion the embodied energy makes over its life cycle. Um, and also identify that building characteristics are a principal function factor in energy consumption, both operational and embodied over their lifetime. So, as I said, operational energy accounts for the major part of life cycle energy consumption for both the residential and commercial examples, that the environmental performance of the building is influenced by its construction, how it's used, climate, and energy supply system. And it's important also, I think, to note one of the things we did with the methodology of both these studies was to look at actual utility bills over a 12-month period to verify the effectiveness and accuracy of the modelling data we had. Um, we identified that upgrading to improve performance depended on the building type. So in the residential examples, it was primarily changes to fabric. In the commercial examples, it was primarily changes to heating and HVAC plant. But that these must be tailored both the individual building and the climactic zone. But I think most importantly, the conclusion is that extending the life of a building by retrofitting is more effective than demolition and replacement. But my final slide I'll show you gives me the image and fact I was searching for at the beginning of this project. And that is, I can say with some confidence, and I think it's a gross underestimation having heard Robert's presentation, that the 1875 125 square metre terraced house in West Melbourne has the embodied energy equivalent to the primary energy in 62 and a half tonnes of Latrobe Valley brown coal. It's a fantastic place to finish and a great place to begin um, Megan's talk, which has the unequivocal title, Heritage Conservation is Sustainable. Full stop. <laughs> so, so Megan is uh, Practice Director at Tanner Kibble Denton Architects, where she leads the Heritage Group. She's undertaken numerous conservation management plans and conservation and adaptive reuse projects, many of which have received local and international awards. Megan is the chair of the Australian Institu Institute of Architects Committee for the New Alterations and Additions publication, which is a joint venture with New South Wales Heritage Branch. So please welcome Megan to um, drive her point home. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, Robert, for inviting um, me to, to speak. Um, 
just as a by way of introduction, I went to University of New South Wales and my um, graduating thesis was the role of conservation and adaptive reuse in the revitalisation of urban areas. And from, from, so from very early, I guess, formative views at university and through my whole career, I've been able to follow that thesis all the way through. So um, I've been an architect for 40 years and uh, every project that I've worked on has involved um, extending the life um, of existing heritage buildings. And today I'm just going to speak about three projects that we've been working o on over, over this last five years. Um, and Tanner Kibble Denton Architects is a general practice. Um, we've got 50 staff, and we, but we do have a specialty in working on, exist on heritage sites and, and buildings. So over the past five years, uh, we've had the privilege and responsibility to guide the conservation and adaptation of several major 20th century civic and commercial buildings in Sydney and Brisbane. Each of them, as originally designed, harnessed natural light and ventilation through light wells, large windows, high ceilings, narrow footprints, while quality materials and detailing ensure durability with massive external walls of concrete structure and solid stone or terracotta masonry and steel or bronze frame framed windows. At the time, uh, their building services were limited to electrical power, the task lighting and fans and heaters for environmental control. So at the time of their construction, these buildings represented best practice in environmentally sustainable design. Each of these projects conserved and restored the facades, the structure, the internal floor plates, high ceilings, light wells and their atria within the existing building envelopes and quality external and internal finishes. And in all cases, the new works were limited to minor alterations to the facades and structure internal fit-out and the introduction of new energy and water efficient building services. So I'm just going to uh, whiz through the case studies um, and I'll just pro probably provide a summary of their significance and then what we've did, done with them um, and then draw some conclusions. So the Brisbane City Hall was constructed between 1920 and 1930. It's on the Queensland Heritage Register, iconic building, um, the biggest city hall in Australia. Um, just to give you an idea of its floor area, 24,000 square metres. It's a big building. Um, it, it actually derived its um, aesthetic style from many buildings that were being built in, in the United States at the time. You can see the... Uh, the, the auditorium in the middle is the huge auditorium surrounded by um, basically blocks of accommodation for off the office staff. You'll see narrow footprint, narrow footprint floor plates and light wells to bring natural light in. The tower is a dominating feature of the building. Just give you an idea, the Queen came visited. Just gives you an idea of the, the, the uh, quality of the space at, when constructed. But over time, um, partly because its facility managers, maybe the short-sighted nature of, of that, um, it was basically neglected and not maintained. And um, it also had some inherent problems. The concrete that was used when it was built um, they'd, use, they'd mixed it with the water from the Brisbane River. <laughs> so um, it was pretty, pretty bad concrete. Um, but then with, with not maintaining the roof, the water, water leaking into the concrete had destroyed, started destroying the concrete. It wasn't sinking. If anybody thinks that it was sinking, it wasn't sinking. Um, it had incredible uh, foundations. But retrofitting uh, services, um, smashing... Oh, that's what it looked like previously. What, you, what you're not seeing here is that um, the top layer of um, three, that's a three-storey space and the top zone was actually originally naturally lit and they'd covered it all up to improve the acoustics. Poor natural light, um, poor attention to, 
to uh, detailing. Being, re being retrofitted with faux heritage um, introductions to Lord Mayor's office, the fiberglass ceiling. Um, so they've been ba it's basically progressively um, vandalised. And uh, the light wells, which had once been the lungs and, and eyes of the building, had been filled up with services because that was the most logical place to put them, wasn't it? You know, just chuck all the new services if you need them. Air conditioning. I didn't have air conditioning originally, but you, know, you need air conditioning in Queensland. Um, so they just put it all into the light wells. So, and then they put frosted glass so that you wouldn't see the services in the, anyway, so you can see what had happened. So in 2009, the Brisbane City Council announced that it really needed to do something about the building, partly brought on because the uh, Queensland Fire and Rescue Service told um, the Lord Mayor at the time, Campbell Newman, that they wouldn't come if the building started burning down because it wasn't safe for their own people to enter the building. So that sort of put with a bit of a quandary. You can't really have a public building that isn't safe for the public. So, um, yeah, so... Basically, they decided, right, this is it. We're going to launch into a big, big uh, refurbishment um, program. And we were very privileged to be the principal architects um, for that, partly because of our heritage experience and partly because of our experience with large, large buildings of this, of this type. Um, and it was... They'd, it cost a lot of money anyway. Um, just to let you know, that's, that's basically the, func the, uh, the function of the building. Um, you had the public entrances in the red, um, and then the light wells, and then the in-house or internal circulation um, was in the purple. And we spent a lot of time really understanding the way the building worked, um, what its original design intent was, how it functioned originally um, to, to draw on our, um, our design. So this uh, comprehensive restoration program, it conserved the, civic, the city hall's significant spaces. We rectified all its structural issues and its fire and life safety deficits, and re-equipped it for its role as a focus of Brisbane city, civic, cultural and social events. We actually used uh, new technologies. We introduced durable new materials. Um, we tried to avoid uh, cost, costly and energy sapping materials. We restored um, all the uh, significant spaces we actually removed um, a lot of the layers of the introduced layers of ceilings and walls to hide services, and, and we've basically exposed the services and have been installed them. But also that means that they can be replaced readily uh, in the future. If we're not, you know, you're not having to pull the whole building apart to uh, to replace. This was that's the building, that's the room that was the green one in the previous slide. So got rid of the false ceiling, raised the um, the services up to up to the ceiling level. Re-established the windows for light. Um, they'd all been covered with curtains because they thought that was heritage <sighs> over time. But it actually showed this, th this result um, showcases, and that's the other room, um, that the building's original architectural qualities and its new contemporary amenity, and it, cannot, and it can be done, you can upgrade a building like this for continued use um, by adding on, by making it comply with the Building Code of Australia, providing it with energy efficient um, services, um, and you can do it in such a way that it still retains um, its, its, I guess, its heritage value and its heritage features. These are the light wells as um, re established. Um, but we've introduced, you know, there's water, har we've got um, rainwater harvesting, we've got um, solar hot water, uh, we, we, we had the, the add ons as well. Um, this project ach achieved four stars, GBCA, and I'll go on to that later. Staggering, really. The next building I want to talk about is one that's under construction, the project's under construction at the moment, and it's the uh, former Commonwealth Bank of Australia building. This was the first building built in Sydney when, after the Commonwealth was formed, and it was, it was the, for the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, built in 1916 and then extended in 1933. Um, one of the first steel frame buildings of its type um, in Australia and was exemplary in terms of its an energy efficiency, um, operational en energy efficiency. Okay. Um, 
This is one of the. Uh, this is a really good example. This is the dining room. No natural, no artificial lighting. It's completely naturally lit. lit. They actually then painted over the uh, skylights because they want to do PowerPoint presentations. Banking chamber. Did I? Did you see the other banking chamber? Again, very minute um, electrical lighting, mostly naturally lit. High quality Australian materials, marbles, terrazzo, um, silky oak joinery, um, Wonderlick um, glass and Wonderlick um, press metal. It had this fantastic light well and um, because they wanted more space they filled it in. So, and because they'd filled it in it actually became a depressing space. So you can do anything in a depressing depressing space, can't you? So you just keep on adding layers and layers and false ceilings and, um, and basically this is what it had become when we first started working on it. The, lo the ceilings actually came down across the windows. So this, um, this building is now owned by a, a superannuation fund, joint venture, and it's a very big project, um, and the intention is to, to demolish the later additions, um, remove all the false ceilings and walls and, and floors, um, and re-establish the original light well um, as an atrium throughout the building, and an open atrium, not, um, not a closed atrium. Provide new electrical and fire services, um, all the adaptation works for BCA compliance and equitable access, and conservation um, and reactivation um, of the building, plus an extension at the back. So it's a big job. This is the, floor, the uh, ground floor floor plate, uh, which shows the original banking chamber on the left, um, which will be conserved, and on the right, uh, the new core for the new building. <coughs> Just some views of uh, what the new building will be like. This is the restored atrium. You compare it with, the, with what, what had happened to the building. This is really just reconstructing, reopening up the light wall that was there. Uh, you can see we've actually pulled down all, intending to pull down all the ceilings and, and leave all the services exposed. So we've maximised the inherent features of the building. Again, the, am I running out of time? I might just whiz through this one. It's just say, and I'll, yeah, but I'll. So this is another one that we're working on, 48 Martin Place, another bank building, another huge building, 2,000 square metre floor plate, each floor. Um, built leading up to the Depression, used, um, natu used um, granite and specially built terracotta tile, terracotta cubes for the facade, um, modelled on, on, on the interwar Beaux-Arts um, style of Chicago. This building has been sold by the Commonwealth Bank to Macquarie Bank, and Macquarie will make it their global headquarters. And Macquarie are very well, well renowned for their workplace, um, the quality of the workplaces that they provide for their staff, and this building completely suited their, um, uh, their aspirations. So this is the quality of the interiors, the safety deposit vault, some of the conference room. The banking chamber is the finest in New South Wales. I'm not going to compare it with the Gothic Bank in Victoria. But. Um, but it's, you know, it's up there. Um, once lit by the, the uh, both of these built, the, both of these rooms were once lit by intent, e extensive uh, light wells, um, which had been covered over uh, in the 80s to provide air conditioning um, space. This is the atrium that was built, converted in the light, the, the light well that was converted in the 1980s to an atrium, and you can see the garden at the bottom of the um, the middle slide. That's actually built over the uh, lay light that gave natural light into the banking chamber. That's because they could fit air conditioning in. And this is, again, it, it sort of dwells on what Hoy was saying about um, natural light and versus um, electrical lighting. This is what they'd done to this building. Very, there was originally a very ingenious ceiling system um, which had services built into it. Um, but it maintained a very high ceiling, but inc incorporated the services into the ceiling. That didn't work really well, very well for the sort of air conditioning we need in the 1960s, so that all got removed. And, you know. 
state-of-the-art pressed metal ceilings put in. This is the proposal. Uh, we're working with um, Johnson Pilton Walker on this one, um, re-establishing the atrium as a, a space for, as for light and uh, ventilation. In fact, we're uh, utilising the atrium for return air as well. Um, this is the quality that we're expecting in the restored um, banking chamber with natural light once again flooding through the lay lights into, the, into that banking chamber. And it's got an addition, it's got a new roof on the top. Um, looks like that. Uh, both those projects will, will, will achieve five GBCA green stars. I just want to move on to, um, I guess, two other points that I wanted to make. Um, so we, we, prepared, we were preparing the GBCA submissions for each of these um, projects because as commercial and community projects, we wanted to, our owners, the owner, our clients wanted to demonstrate that they were doing the right thing from um, an energy uh, sustainability point of view. But we actually, it became very apparent while we were preparing the GBCA submissions that the Green Star rating criteria did not recognise these her heritage buildings' inherent value. Um, the reuse of a building was not adequately recognised, nor was the building's contribution to our understanding of our history and culture. It was apparent that the GBCA rating tools were developed to assess a new building's operational use rather than whole-of-life energy use, including building construction. Now, new buildings are nearly always cited as energy-efficient construction using green building standards. And the current sustainable design measuring criteria in Australia have erroneously substantially underestimated the import importance of embodied energy in managing, measuring energy efficiency. And have also underestimated the great efficiency of well-built historic buildings. And our existing buildings are often a victim of misplaced newer is better mentality. The CSIRO Department of Materials Science Energy and Engineering paper on embodied energy published, oops, published um, in 2008. The energy embodied in existing building stock in Australia is equivalent to 10 years of the total energy consumption for the entire nation. Now, other speakers have talked about embodied energy and, and life, cycle, life cycle analysis. And the main thing I wanted to say in this case is that We struggled to actually get the buildings up to six star unless we'd actually added a whole heap of other stuff. We had to add tri-generation plants. We had to add wall insulation, can you believe it? We, had, we, you know, we were required to add extra insulation for, for the windows um, because we, the value of the existing building was completely discredited by the GBCA. At last, though, this is just recently in a, in a publication. Romilly Madieu, who's the CEO of the Green Building Council, said this. In terms of our existing building stock, it's clear that demolishing and rebuilding it to new, environmentally sustainable benchmarks is not only impractical, it's also counterproductive. Upgrading these buildings makes economic, social and environmental sense. So we really look forward to the GBCA revising their rating tools to acknowledge this common sense approach and to also include social and cultural metrics in the rating tools to acknowledge heritage conservation as a sustainable action. And I think the previous speakers have demonstrated, and the research that I've done has demonstrated also, there is a lot of evidence out there um, that proves that continuing the life of an existing building is an environmentally sustainable action. The Preservation Green Lab, uh, which was the division of the National Trust of Historic Preservation in the USA, produced a document, The Greenest Building, quantifying the value of building reuse. It did very, very detailed studies. It compared of in building types, in building a new building and restoring an existing building, commercial, residential, um, educational buildings. And the results of the study um, was pretty evident that uh, retaining and reusing existing buildings reduces climate impact over building new. The study found that it takes 10 to 80 years for a new building 
that is 30 per cent more efficient than average performing existing building to overcome through efficient operations and the negative climate change impacts related to the construction process. While there's more work to be done, um, reusing old buildings results in immediate and lasting environmental benefits. That's what, that was their conclusion. These were the other findings that this, this study made. The building reuse has fewer environmental impacts than new construction when comparing buildings of like size and functionality. And reusing of buildings with an average level of energy performance offers immediate climate change compared to building new and efficient, energy efficient construction. But they did have a warning that materials matter and the choice of new materials when you're reusing an existing building can actually be counterproductive in the, uh, the process, so to be very careful about that. I'm suggesting that there's further research required um, to improve the perception of uh, reusing of, of heritage buildings being environmentally um, responsible. We need, to find, we need to know more about life cycle uh, costs and uh, obviously a lot, a lot of work's being done. We need to evaluate the durability and embodied energy of existing and new materials. You'll note that the GBCA never talks about the embodied energy of the new materials. So you can't, what we found was staggering. You actually got more points for putting bike parking in your building than you did for keeping existing building. That's how crazy it is. Um, we have to explore the impacts of different construction practices. Um, I'm thinking of uh, re replaceable cladding materials, that sort of thing, which um, is very energy. You know, a Luca bond, material, really, really, really energy expensive. Um, we need to understand a building's, op building's existing operational energy consumption. Just an example of that is that um, in the Brisbane City Hall project, it was recommended that we reglaze all the windows with low um, with E glass. Well, I said, well, what exactly is that going to help? Because the energy that we're going to expend to destroy the existing windows and the cost of these, this new glass surely far outweighs what minor energy improvement in the, in the operational um, side of the building. Anyway, I won that argument, mainly because of cost in the end. <laughs> it was going to cost too much. Um, then the, the last thing was that we need to actually establish, we've talked about existing buildings and we've talked about heritage buildings and I think we really need to establish criteria for measuring the cultural heritage contribution. You know, is it, is, is, if it's at nas national significance, you get three stars just like that or three points just like that. Some, something, that's another, you know, that's not for me to do, I'm just a dumb architect. <laughs> I can't do that sort of stuff. But these are the principles that we've followed as architects. Um, understand the significance of the building and all its components. Understand why it was built, how it was built, how it performed when it was built. Understand, respect and optimise inherent qualities of those buildings. Conserve the fabric, spaces and elements. Re-establish lost elements, like the light wells, like the, 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 the high ceilings, like the, that, that sort of thing. Um, and design all amenity and structure, service and building code upgrades to respect the significant fabric spaces and elements and carefully select any new materials and building services for their environmental qualities, durability and their compatibility. Our next speaker is uh, Roger Beeston. Roger is a director of RBA Architects and Conservation Consultants. He's been involved in a wide variety of heritage places throughout Victoria for state and local government agencies, private individuals, organisations and corporations. He also he's also served as the Deputy Chair of Oz Heritage since 2000. Um, and as part of this, he's participated in many heritage missions, including to India, Myanmar, Brunei and China. Roger's talk is titled, Many Parallels, Some Issues. Cultural Heritage Conservation as a Subset of Whole of, Envi whole en whole of Environment Conservation. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this symposium. 
Uh, as described by Justine, I'm a, a heritage conservation architect, and so my experience and bias comes from involvement in this sector. For 25 years, I've worked on the identification and conservation of built heritage assets across the state, most of which are of a relatively high level of attributed cultural heritage significance, and for which most have extremely limited funding opportunities. Often, in fact, typically insufficient funds are available for even the most routine of maintenance restoration. Accordingly, the opportunity to firstly unravel the green credentials, and then secondly, to design and retrofit such heritage places with modern advanced ESD technologies is, in my experience, rare indeed. Complicating matters is the sensitivity of adapting an old building with modern technologies, wherein such, in wherein such interventions can often lead to a diminution or damage to the heritage values. This is not to say that heritage buildings cannot and are not routinely modernized. It's often essential for this process to occur to enable ongoing sustainable uses where the heritage asset is deemed code compliant and so safe for use. It's just that the opportunity to add supplementary ESD initiatives after dealing with the costly basic conservation measures is in my experience very limited and perhaps also not necessary or desirable. While my professional experience is primarily concerned with the conservation of built cultural heritage, I nonetheless acknowledge and wholeheartedly support the need to reduce our collective environmental impact, and I'm entirely supportive of the rapidly developing environmental conservation movement. It's my contention that the heritage conservation and environmental conservation movements are complementary uh, with much in common. I believe, though, that hol holistic sustainable development is about addressing both cultural and ecological systems, and that the endeavor to in conserving cultural heritage is simply part of the broader endeavor to conserve the whole environment. Back before ESD was invented, at least as an acronym anyway, the 1970s green bands in Sydney and Melbourne demonstrated a healthy and natural synchronicity and interconnectedness of the two movements. Environmental activism by builders' laborers who refused to work on projects that were environmentally or culturally undesirable. Ironically, it was the builders' laborers who, in conjunction with the National Trust, and other like-minded organizations which seemed most vocal in opposing wanton destruction of decaying heritage assets. The BLF referred to their actions as green bans, while the National Trust more politely were actioning to save heritage. But both were attempting to achieve the same outcome. However, now, in spite of the many obvious parallel objectives of the two movements, their relationship is perhaps becoming uneasy in the face of modern pressures such as urban sprawl and carbon reduction goals. Environmentally sustainable design has become prevalent in recent years, fashionable even, and it would be easy to think that this is a result of new technologies and the now recognized need to reduce our environmental impact due to excessive carbon dioxide and the resultant threat of global warming. But environmentally sustainable design is not a new idea, it's just a new name. Many heritage buildings have ESD cred, and it's not just about the value of their embodied energy, it's also about the way that they were originally designed, that is, passively combination of building materials, orientation, light, shade and ventilation assisted in heating and cooling and bringing light into buildings before electrical alternatives. Many heritage buildings have such qualities or systems, although they are typically underutilized. Examples abound. In the 19th century, Frederick Sargwood, a wealthy state government minister, established Ripon Lee, a 10-hectare property at Elstonwick, with a two-story mansion and a large formal pleasure garden of exotic species. Not your typical greeny type, you might think, but in fact, Sargwood designed his estate to be self-sufficient. Water from the roof was to be collected in large underground tanks for reuse in the house. Waste from the house and the stables was to be used on the vegetable gardens and orchards that supplied the Sargwood family and the estate workers. But most notable of all was Sargwood's irrigation system, a complex underground network of pipes which, which harvested stormwater runoff from the surrounding neighborhood to be stored in, large man, in, in a large man-made lake and recycled to water the garden. However, according to an article in The Age, by the end of the 20th century, 70% of this estate's water requirements were coming from the Maine's water supply. A dilemma arose as drought and increasing water costs meant it became a struggle to keep the garden well maintained to attract visitors. The current owners of the site, the National Trust, addressed this problem by restoring Sargwood's or original irrigation system, and the gardens are now 98% self-sufficient.
Another example of an early irrigation system is at Woodlands, an 1840s property on the northwest outskirts of Melbourne. Ben Chafee, the owner of the property from 1917 to 37, was the son of George Chafee, a seminal figure in the development of the Mildura and Renmark irrigation areas at the turn of the 20th century and in California prior to that. Ben Chafee, ben Chafee utilized knowledge gained from uh, exposure to his father's work to develop an innovative irrigation system which allowed for the watering of his exotic garden. Woodlands is included on the Victorian Heritage Register and the Statement of Significance identifies the irrigation system for its scientific value. Perhaps it also sh should be recognized for its ESD credibility. One, one of the recommendations we made in the conservation management plan we prepared for Woodlands was to consider recommissioning this irrigation system in, installed by the Chafees, particularly as the garden at Wood, Woodlands is one of its main attractions. But I'm not aware of whether this has happened or not. Uh, going back to my comment about insufficient funds. Uh, during the 1800s, commercial buildings in the city of Melbourne were beginning to be built taller and closer together, and this created the new problem of trying to get natural light and ventilation to central parts of buildings, again before the advent of electricity and mechanical systems to modulate envi internal environments. Uh, two prominent heritage-listed buildings which we've worked on in the CBD, the Australian Club and, uh, and Scottish House on William Street, were originally commissioned with light wells connected to a uh, sophisticated array of passive, passive ducted air handling systems which modulated the internal environments. And I, and I won't bother to explain the, the detail of this. I, th I think most of us are aware of the, of the, of the, uh, of the technique of, of, a, of a thermal chimney, but uh, effectively there's, a, there's the light well, uh, the, uh, the, nat the natural uh, thermal inclination for, for air, hot air to rise is drawn through uh, ducts, uh, vents that, that draw air from under the floor and out, out through the cornice, uh, and, and this whole system can be, uh, can be controlled uh, manually with, uh, with uh, various uh, vents opening and closing. Uh, the, the moral of the story here is, however, that uh, unfortunately, in the case of the Australian Club, we can see uh, air conditioning systems have been introduced to these light wells, hence compromising their ability to work uh, passively uh, and effectively anymore. Uh, and, uh, and in the case of uh, Scottish House, um, as for the previous speaker, the, uh, the light wells have been removed altogether to, to gain uh, extra floor space. Uh, another project we've been working on um, is at uh, Arts House, uh, part of the uh, Victoria College of the Arts Complex, University of Melbourne as well. Uh, good ventilation was, was one of the cornerstones of advances in hospital design from the mid-19th century. Arts House is obviously a former hospital. Uh, and different types of ventilation systems were developed to, uh, to provide the required levels of air circulation. The ventilation system employed at the former Victoria Police Hospital consisted of an extensive series of wall tubes at about the mid-height of the windows and roof ventilators in the form of metal flues and lanterns to the first floor wards. These were linked to metal tubing in the roof space above the vents. Uh, the system was decommissioned in the 1950s and also partly dismantled. We recently prepared a conservation management plan for the building and one of our recommendations is to reinstate the ventilation system. Doing so would have the benefits uh, for the functionality of the building and may even limit the need to introduce modern air, condition, air conditioning systems which are so intrusive. Uh, at Parliament House, uh, some of the original ESD credibility is identified as contributing to the cultural heritage significance of the place. In 1859, a system of passive air conditioning was devised to cool and ventilate the Legislative Assembly Chamber in the new Parliament House. In 1889, this was improved by the addition of a tunnel to bring fresh air from an inlet shaft concealed, which we can see on the right there, uh, concealed by a domed temple folly structure in the garden. Um, so basically, that structure uh, is, is, a, is also surrounded by uh, some lovely pine trees and the concept here is that uh, fresh air is, is drawn into the, into, the, uh, into the shaft and down a tunnel where we have uh, hessian bags being uh, damp hessian bags and, and, and a really wonderful passive system. Uh, ironically now that tunnel uh, houses air conditioning ductwork. A slightly more tangential example is the local Granger Museum, just located to the, to the north here on the main university campus. 
In 2009, we prepared a master plan for the Granger Museum that explored passive strategies to avoid the installation of high-impact mechanical air conditioning. Uh, to support our view, materials, uh, museum's materials conservation advice indicated that a mechanical air handling system may have a highly detrimental effect on the fragile artifacts in the museum, including the stringed instruments designed and built by Percy Granger. In response and in deference to a design which had been clearly conceived to be without mechanical environmental modulation, we proposed a new subterranean wing to accommodate administra administration offices and a storage facility so as to maintain a separation from the sensitive uh, exhibition environment, conserving its cultural heritage values and concomitantly capturing its inherent passive ESD uh, design attributes such as thermal mass, natural ventilation, shade, etc. With heritage buildings, I think that it's important to take a step back and consider the passive qualities and any underutilized systems a heritage place might have and to work with these in the first instance. The introduction of modern energy saving devices or systems has the potential to be detrimental to heritage buildings, not only aesthetically but also physically. So an understanding of how the extant passive systems worked is vital. For example, ventilation was an important design aspect in masonry and timber floored buildings to reduce dampness. Thus, sealing up a building and or introducing sealing insulation may hinder its ability to breathe and may also have detrimental, con which, which may have detrimental consequences to the building fabric. Part of this process may involve challenging our modern expectations. Maybe a turn of the century ventilation system can be used instead of air conditioning. Maybe light wells mean that electrical lighting can be uh, reduced. And with a, need, with a reduced need for aircon and lighting, there would be less need for photovoltaic cells. This way, there may be opportunities to kick two goals at once, a better heritage outcome and a better environmental outcome. So before introducing modern equipment at a heritage building, let's first explore systems that the building might already have, then do as much as necessary and as little as possible. Currently, there are requirements imperatives for a building's energy efficiency and water conservation in building regulations that have implications for heritage buildings, where a threshold of new building work is to take place that is, uh, any proposed restoration or additions. That is, uh, as for the requirement to upgrade a heritage asset to comply with uh, contemporary building standards generally, so too is there now a requirement typically, where possible, to upgrade the ESD grading rating of such a place. There are resultant and wor worrisome tensions which are arising as a result of the sometimes at odds intent of such ESD-driven legislation and the imperatives of the more established heritage conservation management statutory frameworks. The overzealous application of current ESD technology and the statutory ex expectation that all buildings conform is a real threat to the conservation of our cultural heritage. The Castlemaine Market was built in 1862 and was originally one of three such buildings set in a broader market square. Its use as an agricultural produce market was discontinued in the 1960s and it's currently used by the council as a visitor information centre council offices and a community exhibition space. It's a building of high cultural significance, potentially even of national significance, by virtue of its unusual architectural design, its demonstration of Castlemaine's early prosperity during the gold rush years, its continuity of use over a 105 year period, its rarity as an early colonial market, and most importantly in the context of this talk, its high degree of intactness of form and fabric. The image of the facade is an icon of the town as the harbour bridge is to Sydney, the market building is to Castlemaine. Castlemaine Market has twice been saved from demolition due to local and statewide protests led by the National Trust and local citizens in the 1950s and again in the 1960s. Now in the, 20th first, now in the 21st century, a new threat has emerged, ESD statutory imperatives. Castlemaine Market is owned by the Mount Alexander Shire Council, a council strongly committed to environmentally, environmental sustainability, which prides itself on its leadership on a range of environmental issues. The Mount Alexander Greenhouse Action Plan provides guidance in managing council's greenhouse gas emissions, and there are some actions which have implications for council-owned heritage assets. In the hands of such uh, an environmentally conscious and well-meaning council, there's an implicit intention to make an example 
of the Castle Main Market Building and introduce as much green bling to it as possible. Such actions could both threaten the sensitive heritage values and divert limited financial resources away from the core business of heritage building fabric conservation. And our concern is not baseless. Currently there are plans afoot to cover the roof of the heritage sensitive town hall in Castlemaine with photovoltaic cells, where they will in fact be very visible in the rear and side views. Ironically, the proposal to demolish the Castlemaine market in the 1950s was to make way for the offices of the State Electricity Commission. You could argue the building has already done its bit for the environment just by staying put. <laughs> when it comes to heritage buildings, we need to be circumspect when applying modern ESD and conscious of not slavishly adopting it at huge expense and huge heritage intrusion. ESD is not, one si is not a one-size-fits-all. The incorporation of ESD at heritage buildings needs to be carefully managed and tailored to fit each individual case. The option to reverse any changes made to accommodate ESD technology is highly desirable, as the current technology will undoubtedly be improved in the future. The degree to which a heritage building is able to accommodate ESD principles without negative impact on its particular significance will vary. For some heritage buildings, in particular those of high cultural significance like the Castlemaine Market, it simply may not be in the best interests of the building to fully adopt ESD technology, if at all. And that should be deemed okay. Back to Ripon Lee, which, by the way, is included on the National Heritage List. These pictures were taken just a month ago after the roof restoration works and the installation of photovoltaic tiles to the roof. You can't see them, of course. They're hidden in the roof valley and cover just 10% of the total roof area, but they supply all of the power the property needs. This is the first time the Trust have introduced solar panels to any of its 300 properties across Australia. Not all of the trust properties would lend themselves to such an intervention, but at Rip and Lee, not only are the tiles invisible, they're in keeping with the original ethos of self-sufficiency at the property. One would imagine that the original owner, Frederick Sargwood, would most certainly have approved. As our population expands, increasing urban density is an important strategy for reducing our environmental impact, particularly here in Melbourne, which is one of the largest cities in the world in terms of area. Just last week, a draft of the government's 40-year metropolitan planning strategy was, was released. As the city approaches 5 million people, the strategy aims to reduce urban sprawl. Such a goal will, will increasingly have implications for heritage buildings, particularly suburban residential heritage. It is in this arena that heritage practitioners should also not be overzealous in attempting pr to preserve everything of historic interest and conversely be prepared to let some heritage buildings of less significance go for the greater good. A recent VCAT decision which received considerable publicity was the approval to demolish the Queen Anne style residence at 1045 Burke Road in Hawthorne East, a site that was covered by an individual heritage overlay in the planning scheme. This was to make way for a four-story building uh, which would contain 33 dwellings, from one dwelling to 33 on the one site. Borondura Council had objected to both the demolition of the building and the proposed building, new building on heritage grounds. But in making its decision, VCAT took into consideration the broader policy context, including planning policy for urban consolidation, housing diversity, sustainable development and urban design, and did not, did not limit itself to matters pertaining to heritage only. A similar case, uh, a similar VCAT case uh, took place about 10 years ago, which we were involved in. A, uh, a relatively ordinary Californian bungalow house uh, in, in uh, central St Kilda, um, with, certainly with plenty of embodied energy credentials, but, but really uh, a house that was able to, uh, to, to, to ha 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 provide accommodation for one family uh, with, replaced here by uh, three townhouses, which, which uh, were at the time of the very highest uh, environmentally sustainable design credentials. So um, again, uh, I guess ordinary heritage making way for uh, improved environmentally sustainable housing. And so in conclusion, I would concur with Sir Neil Cossens, the former chair of English Heritage, when he observes that the historic environment, like the green environment, is continuously evolving and renewing itself. 
The historic environment certainly has the capacity to accommodate a certain amount of change, including making a contribution to environmental sustainability. But it must also be conceded that the historic environment, the part of the environment which represents the very best of our cultural heritage, is special. That it typically already is environmentally credentialed and that blind retrofitting with modern ESD technology may not be in the best interests of either the heritage asset or the broader environment in many cases. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. I think that very skillfully um, charted some of the tensions that we're here to discuss today. And our final speaker um, this for this session is Evelyn Ling. Um, Evelyn is an associate and senior sustainability consultant with Norman Disney and Young. She specialises in ESD and energy and environment ma environmental management, and she's championed ESD initiatives for projects across the commercial, retail, residential, education, and health sectors. She's a Green Star accredited professional and also conducts peer review on external GBCA submissions. And Evelyn today is going to talk to us about Good Sheds North. So my talk will be on the Good Shed North, which is the picture that you are seeing in your brochures. So that's why I was asked. <laughs> So um, the Good Shed North, um, what it originally was, was a train shed that ran from the end of Collins Street all through to Burke Street. It was cut in half to allow for the extension of the road in the middle. So that's why there's the Good Shed North, which is the project that I'll be talking about now. And there's the Good Shed South, which is owned by Walker. You see with the pineapple shaped building along Collins Street. So today's presentation, I'll be talking about the significance in sustainability, um, the building attribute itself, the challenges and the bonuses of um, this project being a heritage listed building, and the strategies that we used um, from water transport materials, indoor environment and energy to make this project the way it is. So I'll talk about the Green Star aspects first, but that's not the main um, topic of my uh, talk. So originally this project was registered as a four star green star because that was the minimum green star requirement in those days. So I've worked on this project since 2006 registering the project with the Green Building Council and at that time the Green Building Council had not worked with any heritage listed buildings. They just knew that it was up and coming. They weren't sure what we were doing about it, what we were keeping, what we were retaining. So in the couple of years leading up to the upgrade of the four star to a five star, I actually um, had in-depth conversations with the Green Building Council about changing some of the benchmarks that we talked about with regards to uh, reuse of uh, facade, reuse of structure, and actually some of the rules that are in the current Green Star rating tools about you know, refurbishment of projects, how there's some restrictions with boundaries, they were actually as a result of our conversation with the Green Building Council in the early days. So the two tenants in the building is Vic Urban, so they were, they're now called Places Victoria, and the Building Commission and Plumbing Commission of um, Australia. So they had a push for this four-star project to become a five-star because they want to, you know, above average. They don't want just average, they want a bit better than that in 2007. So um, whilst working with this project, we were awarded the design submission in 2009. So if for the people who don't know, design submissions are based on architectural drawings, um, services drawings and specifications. And with the as-built rating, it's based on the documentation that the contractors provide. So rather than you know, designing something, as you know, not everything that you design gets installed on site. Um, so we had to prove that you know, what we were designing was actually constructed. Um, so it was the first heritage building in Victoria to get the Green Star rating, but it's the first heritage project in Australia to get the design and as-built rating. Okay. So what, did it, what was it? So it was an old railway shed, so trains go in there, get repaired, get stored. So therefore, there's a long nature of the building itself. Um, so it was derelict, it had full of asbestos, um, homeless people lived in it. We had a big clean out of the building prior to construction, um, as you probably imagine. 
Um, so this building, the Good Shed North, had two street frontages, um, one on Collins Street, one on Burke Street, and they have the two separate addresses for the two tenants. Um, very long building, very large roof space. And there was a lot of restrictions to the boundary um, and the height of the building. So we weren't able to expand beyond it with any landscape or anything like that. Um, and we weren't able to build um, on top of the heritage building. But we were able to extend on the Collins Street side is where the entry of um, Vic Urban now called Places Victoria is. So that's the architectural drawing of the building. Um, you can see the long facades. And because we were doing the Green Star rating, um, we get points for, as mentioned before, things like um, public transport, cyclist facilities. So we had to um, talk to the Green Building Council about using the existing spaces and not providing all the facilities in one spot because what's the point of providing, say, waste um, waste storage areas in one central location when there's going to be two tenants used on either end. So these were the compromising um, solutions that we had to talk about with the Green Building Council. So each tenant on each end had their own facilities within the space. So some of the challenges, as you would know, with um, heritage buildings is that the building envelope does not meet with the Section J, the current Section J legislations. So, um, so the triple brick facade, although it's strong in integrity um, and so forth, it didn't meet the current tick box of you know, the BCA standards. The single glazed windows, as you know, doesn't really get specced nowadays. And what we had to do with that was we had to source out pretty much exactly the same colour and specification of the glass that they had. Because of the heritage sensitivity, we weren't able to, ins to replace any of the existing glass with um, double glazing windows. And we also had to match some of the windows that have been damaged through you know, vandalism and so forth, and graffiti. Um, the high floor to ceiling in the middle, um, so we weren't able to put occupants in the central space. Um, because we weren't able to service that central space. I'll talk about the bonuses of that later on. Um, and we weren't able to put a lot of penetrations through the facade and the roof. So the penetrations are required for your exhaust fans in your toilets, for example, um, smoke relief fans for fire. So if there was a fire to go through, you need to exhaust the smoke and fire somehow. We weren't able to do the traditional methods. We had to do a lot of fire engineering with regards to um, people escaping, fire curtains and so forth that are very hidden in the building itself. The bonuses. The existing structure, the steel structure of the rail shed, because it was built for the rail industry, you had to withstand the vibrations, you had to stand with the loads of the trains coming in and out. Um, advised by the structural engineer said that if there was a tornado, the only thing that will survive through this building would be the structural steel beams that went through. So we reused that and that was a good thing for the, um, the project because it actually held the facade together during the construction phase. Um, we use the existing openings of the railway sheds along the side. So if you ever walk past the building, there's these little domey openings. And because of that, um, it allowed natural light to come through the building, but it didn't um, excessively heat or you lose heat uh, during the winter times as well. Um, due to the high ceiling openings off um, along the middle part, it actually allowed a lot of natural light into the space and that's why minimal lighting is put through that area there. So some of the services strategies that um, this building had was, you know, the normal uh, water efficient fixtures and fittings that uh, a building would have nowadays. We actually had a rainwater tank installed under the, um, the ground. Um, and also the existing trough in the middle of the building where the train tracks used to go to, we use that as a services um, distribution. So not only for water distribution, but also the mechanical services, electrical services, all went down the middle um, of the rail shade. Um, and the rainwater tank is used for toilet flushing and irrigation. So it um, beats the best, uh, best practice standards. Transport, so we had to provide some um, cyclist facilities for uh, the tenants so that they can use it. Um, so no, park, no car parking was um, 
provided for this site. Originally, um, Ecoset as a developer wanted two levels of basement under the existing building, and we advised them that's probably not the best idea um, from the height and also the, just the, the weight of the building itself. So, and it's so close to um, Spencer Street Station, it's literally you know, less than 100 metres walk from, this, from the station. It's probably not required. Um, so, uh, and we also provide a visitor's uh, facilities near our main entrances so that you, know, you can visit the place without having to drive there. So some of the material strategies actually worked in our favour. So um, we actually claimed our innovation for the first heritage project in Victoria. So the Green Building Council accepted that we worked so much with them to get this project over the line that it was something that they recognised was a, a bit of a flaw in their tool. Uh, reuse of facade and reuse of structure, just way beyond the, um, the current Green Star benchmarks because we re pretty much use all four sides of the building except for the, um, the Collins Street side where they had to split the building in half. Um, for any new materials that went into the building, such as the concrete and steel that's required for the new part, so only the new part of the building had new materials, we used as much recycled content as much as we can from the stuff that was demolished on site. Um, and then the PVC materials, we try to um, step away from the conventional PVC materials that's re uh, required for your you know, pipes, electrical cables and your conduits. So the environmental strategy um, that we had for this building was quite innovative because back in 2006, when this project was registered, the solution for this by the developer said, let's just put the conventional VAV system in there. We just want to make the space a bit comfortable for the occupants. Um, when NDY was brought on um, to provide the mechanical services, we said, let's just change some of the mechanical services for the building to suit the building's shape. So I'll go through that in the next slide. So some of the things that we included to make the building comfortable for the occupants, low VOC paint, sealants, low formaldehyde materials, and we did a lot of thermal comfort modelling to ensure that where we place services was the most comfortable as well as not intrusive to the integrity of the building. So some of the restrictions to low VOC paints, we didn't want to use anything that will be detrimental to the existing facade and structure. So you don't want to use a, a sealant or an adhesive that's going to eat through the existing brickwork of the building. So that was something that we had to look into a lot. Um, so getting something from the man manufacturers is a bit um, costly because we had to go, can you prove that your sealant is not going to eat through this building in five years' time? So the demand for the compliant materials was actually quite low, um, but the good thing is that the materials that are used in this space, the ones that are approved, um, was low in smell. So high frequency ballasts um, were installed to areas where it's actually required, so we didn't have lighting all the way through the building. If anyone has visited in this building before, um, it's actually quite naturally lit. So we incorporate daylight sensors all along the building, so where you have natural daylight available, the electrical light dimmed down and you just use what's um, naturally available to you. So the um, energy strategies were used, so in the centre of the building, because of the high floor-to-ceiling spaces, we use underfloor displacement, and that's using the existing trough that's running down the middle of the building. So there's a bit of an air um, energy used in the fan, but the air just flows straight through and just comes up through um, the floor. We use an active chill beam system, so that it's more energy efficient to blow water around than to push air through the space. And, and that was probably one of the first buildings in Victoria that actually used the chill beam system in a, um, a building in that time. Hydronic heating, now we installed some cleverly concealed um, hydronic heaters along the facade, but based on the years in operation, because of the way that the facade behaves, they've actually hardly ever turned those hydronic heaters on because the, um, the heat that would come through the, the middle of the building would actually keep the building quite warm during the winter time. So they actually hardly ever turn those hydronic heaters on, which is really good. Um, variable speed drives for all the pumps and motors, uh, and motion sensors 
for um, un unoccupied spaces. So this is the clever air distribution system. So all through the center of the building, we use a dis displacement system. So using the existing um, trough for air distribution. And along the facades, we use an active chill beam system. And that's because on the, along the facades, we had to split the levels into two usable spaces. So there was a ground floor and there was a mezzanine floor. The center of the space, um, no tenants occupy those spaces as part of workstations. Uh, they use it for their library system, their breakout areas, just so that they can use that space as an interactive between the two sides of the facade. So sub-metering for large energy usages. So a lot of these things are just to keep the energy operations down, um, separate meters for light and power. So one of the things that we had to do to upgrade from a four-star to a five-star is to install a trigen system. So that trigen system, um, I'll go through the next, I'll go through this slide, um, uses gas into micro turbines which produces heat and electricity on site. The excess heat will go into domestic hot water and the heat is actually used for the cooling of the system. Now with the four micro turbines that we've installed in the space, due to I suppose a lesson learned from this building is that they've actually never used the two, they've only operated two out of two of the trigen system just because they found that the, the, the facade actually works quite well during both summer and winter and actually the energy efficient systems like the chilled beam system actually didn't demand for the micro turbines to be all on. So I'll go through. So talked about the, um, the greenhouse gas reductions just based on the, um, the inclusion of the trigen system and the absorption chiller. So we actually, so this is based on the neighbor's energy rating. So at the moment, the building is operating at a five star energy, five neighbor's energy rating for the base building. And that's the last slide. Sorry, and that's the last slide that I have. Yeah. <laughs>